Thank you very much. I know it's late and you can't wait to get out of the room, so I try to be as precise and short as possible on a topic that actually might interest you. And I'm going back from MRI, where Toshiba now really accelerated development, to two areas where Toshiba had a strong footprint in the past, historically, and that is CT and ultrasound. You probably know that fatty liver is an enormous burden to our society, and whichever you know, data you take, public data, secret data, anecdotal data, you will always hear there's a high risk to our society from fatty liver disease. And in fact, when you look at the data of, of really what sparks the interest is that 10% of people who have fibrosis that originated from fatty liver will eventually develop HCC. It's not a coincidence that in Toronto we have a screening program for HCC that, by the way, involves ultrasound and CT. So it seems to be a topic that goes beyond population health and enters the domain of possibly cancer care. Um, you, you know that there are several stages of fatty liver disease. It starts with a very normal sort of appearing liver, and then for multiple reasons, and that could be food, it could be diabetes, autoimmune diseases, and many other diseases, you may see that the liver deposits fatty components. That is a reversible situation, as well as when this fatty liver turns into an inflammatory stage. Even that can be reversed, and this is exactly where now modern drugs try to kick in to get back from NASH towards the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we're not talking about alcohol, that's a different story I can tell you something about as a German, but let's take that away. We're really talking about the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But if the NASH, the steatohepatitis, is not being treated, there is a high chance that this develops further into liver cirrhosis, and then we all know that has the associated risk factors. There's a great publication, important to note, it comes from gastroenterology, and uh, Dr. Cohen and colleagues published in the World Journal of Gastroenterology in 2014, not only the utilization of ultrasound, they also talked about the limitations, which is quite interesting because traditionally in many jurisdictions, ultrasound is mostly in the hand of, let me call them, non-imagers, non-radiologists. But note, they said it cannot assess the degree of fibrosis. And ultrasound, and that's the topic we talk about, has low sensitivity for um, steatosis when it's actually not as dramatic as we might think. So a major problem here. But note what I have circled here. They always revert back as a reference standard to biopsy. Now, I love liver biopsies. They're quick, easy, low risk. It's fantastic to get all the answers in one shot. That is great. But still, when you look from the patient perspective and patient-centered care, it is an invasive procedure that has, albeit small, some risks involved. And if I was a patient, I probably would opt for a non-invasive technique rather than going for a biopsy if, if I had the choice. So, you know, moving from MRI, which I think is regarded today still as the reference point, um, there's a great technique. We're not talking about in and opposed phase. It's the proton density fat fraction, and that can be applied to almost all areas, organs in the body, which is great. And the reason why this is a multi-echo sequence, Dixon sequence, is because it tries to get rid of the confounding factors, which will be fibrosis, it will be iron, and many other things that can actually influence the value. There's a pretty great paper from, from Dr. Tang and published in Radiology a, a couple of years ago. And what they did is they actually biopsy controlled 77 patients. They had a pretty wide range of inclusion criteria. They just included, excluded one patient because the distance between biopsy and MRI was more than 180 days. But as you know, there's a lot of dynamic ongoing liver. It really matters if you drank a nice German beer yesterday or a vodka, as I heard earlier, and then you will change your liver values dramatically. And it's unclear if any of these biopsy-controlled studies really reflect the truth at the time point when the scanning has been performed. The area under the curve is pretty good, looks pretty nice, but let's look at something that is a bit concerning. Now, you might argue clear correlation between MRI as a reference standard and FAT, but look what the problem is. Let's assume you have a certain value that lies between those red dotted lines. It means it can be one of three categories. 
in fatty liver disease, and that is a problem, right? So as much as it looks great, when it really boils down to categorizing and monitoring patients, it may be a problem. Although the R square, which is the correlation, is 0 0.47. Remember that value when we talk about ultrasound and CT. Let's move on to those other techniques, and specifically when we talk about normalized local variance on ultrasound, which is believed to solving some of the problems on ultrasound, and dual energy CT with texture analysis. So normalized local variance is a very simple technique. It's difficult to compute, but essentially what it is, you take the histogram of the ultrasound, because there is something peculiar to the picture when you know you scan a patient with fatty liver disease, and that variance gets surprisingly more narrow when the patient has fatty liver disease. And we can quantify that value. We need a large area of uh, interest, and then we calculate with multiple measurements these values. On CT, multiple attempts have been tried in the past to tackle that issue of quantifying fatty liver disease. And this is a great group out of Korea, and they tried to come up with a grading system based on the visibility of vessels within the liver. Makes totally sense, because when the fat comes into the liver, it lowers the attenuation, and then the vessels become less and less conspicuous. But as you can imagine, there's a lot of confounding factors. However, this grading system works well. It's not really used in clinical practice. A group of, uh, of Wisconsin, uh, Perry Pickard was one of the authors in this, in this paper here, they utilized, and he was in the group because he did the CT colonography trial. They used the same patients and tried to come up with an analysis multiple ratios, liver versus spleen, and subtraction, and quotients, etc., trying to find just the tip of the iceberg. Let's just try to find the top 5% of the people who have fatty liver in order to, you know, possibly drive some therapy. As we know, most of the fatty liver is reversible. Really worked great. You see here the graph of what they found, and it's a nice method, just simply taking the attenuation on non-contrast CT to identify individuals that have fatty liver disease. Now, you always have to walk before you run, so that's why we try to check if our CT on dual energy really does what it's supposed to do, to be calibrated for fatty tissue. So we took multiple um, items of daily use here, and that, as you can see, is cream and, and, and table cream and whipping cream, to see if actually the value that we are getting is real. And in fact, it is. There's a little of a trick that we play, and it's just a means to get rid of the image noise. And that is when you calculate every five KEV images, you can actually draw a curve through the attenuation value. And then by trying to find the function through that curve, you sort of eliminate a little bit of noise that is inherent in those measurements. It's a trick one can play, and I will show you what we did. So now what we try to do is now to let's, let, let's, let's see how good we are with ultrasound and CT in biopsy-proven patients. But what we try to do differently now from any other study is we wanted to have spatial synchronization. In other words, taking the sample exactly where we make the measurement, which is important. As you know, fatty liver is geographically distributed in the liver, number one. Number two is we want to be timely synchronized. You know, the patient goes home, has a different hydration status, values will change. So we try to bring everything together, both modalities, timely and spatially synchronized. And as you can see here, we did the ultrasound component, the CT component, needle guidance, and then did a dual energy CT over the area with the needle in situ, and then took the regular clinical course. The study, of course, just to be complete, was approved by our local RAB committee. And then we did post-processing. As I said, we reconstructed images on CT every 5 keV to be able to calculate the attenuation curves, and then we calculated the intensity based on the curve fitting of these values, and you see just an example of a liver bottom, uh, at the bottom of the slide, which is a non-contrast CT reconstructed at multiple keV settings. Also, we did, as shown earlier, the normalized local variance analysis on these ultrasound, uh, on the ultrasound images, which were taken right before we took the biopsy of the same area. Now, here's an example. You see the ultrasound. You see us doing the biopsy in the CT suite, and you can see also the reconstructed images on CT. And we try to make sure that the artifact from the needle tip is not influencing the measurement. That's a little bit more difficult than we thought, but technically, that is possible. Now, this completely useless slide, I just put it up to show off a little bit how difficult it was to collect the data. 
not only do we have a large group of patients, but pathologists tend to be very heterogeneous and there's individual preferences, which staging system is available, which are they using, different hospitals have different standards, but also they looked at laboratory values, so it was quite a struggle to standardize the pathology, recognized in the literature beyond our group, of course. But here are, just a little, give you a taste of what the problems are, there is a staging system for fatty liver disease from zero to, to three, and that's pretty easy, zero to five, five to 33%, 34 to 66, and above 66, pretty rough. And that already recognizes the fact that it's not easy to calculate. It's technically eyeballing what the pathologists do. There is a computer algorithm that's barely ever used. So there is some heterogeneity here. When it comes to fibrosis, there is the Brunt stage, which some hospitals adopt, but there's also ISHAC stage that has six categories. And both are used interchangeably. And it's not that easy, as you might think, because they reflect on a different type of fibrosis to convert them into a single value. But here's what we found. Surprisingly, the ADKV images, KV, which is the originally measured image, had a correlation square coefficient of 0 0.68. And to our surprise, 135, which we really didn't anticipate, is even a little bit better. Remember, our square MRI PDFF was 0 0.47. The reason why 135 is a little bit better is, I guess, only because the images were not as noisy. We might see some of the influence of the image noise. But when we take the attenuation curve that is calculated from all the reconstructions, as you can see, the correlation coefficient goes even up to 0 0.74. So quite happy are we with this result, and just for comparison, the latest publication on the PDFF from MRI. Now let's look at ultrasound. When you put this into perspective, it's also very good, it's 0 0.59, the R-square correlation, but it looks pretty good compared to CT. So both seem to pick up nicely the degree of fibrosis and can accurately stage those patients. Now why are we talking about liver fat and then also fibrosis? Because fibrosis can confound your results. Fibrosis elevates the Hounsfield units in CT. It also changes the impression on an ultrasound image. So when you just measure attenuation, you may actually have a false value. And I just try to show to you how important this whole topic might be. We know liver fat may be associated with a metabolic syndrome. And also, quite interesting, recently published, um, is that the relative risk of a stroke is higher when you have fatty liver disease, as is the ratio, odds ratio, when you have mild fibrosis versus strong fibrosis, and the fact it can go up, up to 12. So apparently liver plays an extraordinarily uh, important role. We don't really understand why that's the case, but it seems to be one of the biomarkers possibly we can catch in order to predict further outcomes. Now here what you see is, I showed you this, 0.74, but we also have a problem, and the problem is there's also an overlap on CT. A little bit less than MRI, but we still have the issue of fibrosis confounding the factor that we measure attenuation on CT. Let's, let's see what we can do. Now here's the innovation. We can look at individual voxels. We can look at cortosis and, and root mean square analysis, all these fancy things that most workstations can do. Meanwhile, that don't really improve the correlation. There's an issue with that. But here is what we actually can do. It's a texture analysis. And what I'm showing to you is for all 50 patients, about 2,000 parameters that we analyzed for each voxel in the whole volume and try to come up with a map that shows us maybe one of those parameters actually may correlate better with liver fat. Now, it is beyond the human's eye to detect any of the patterns, which is the reason why we used a very simple machine learning algorithm to come up with something that is more tangible, something that is a pattern that we can use. One way of doing this is just transforming the data into a correlation heat map, which is shown here. The diagonal is, you know, there's always a correlation of one, and we color coded it in blue and yellow. And you see there are distinct patterns. So there must be some sort of parameters out of the 2000 that actually correlate well and may be able to predict fatty liver and fibrosis better than just attenuation values. Now, the algorithm came up with a list, like a hit list. And interesting enough, what you see is decomposition, material decomposition on CTs on the top of the list. Not surprising so because we know what it can do. By the way, one of the parameters we used was the patient's MRN, which should have no correlation with fatty liver at all. But you know, you have to look at all possible parameters as a control to see that the algorithm doesn't go off rail and gives you a correlation that is not real. And we did the same thing for fibrosis as well. Now here comes the interesting point. 
And that's the thing. We have fat quantification, I've shown you that graph before, with an overlap when it comes to severe stages. Now let's correct the data with the machine learning algorithm based on texture parameters and see what you get. A much better separation when it comes to fat. So it seems like a combination of fat analysis, the traditional way, in addition for correction of fibrosis that is based on texture analysis, really is the game here. And it allows us to accurately predict the fat in the liver and also fibrosis. Does that translate into an image? Of course, we are radiologists, we want to see it. And those are the, some of the images we generate and you see the probability score. Any machine learning, artificial intelligence will give you a probability score that says that's likely what I think or the algorithm thinks and then we can either accept it or you know, overrule it. See the probability score is 0 0.89, 0 0.9, 0 0.96 to accurately predict the liver. Plus, we have a geographical distribution that is color-coded as an overlay over the CT image. Now, we tested it on all patients. As you know, in real life, there's always some outliers. We do not know why primary uh, sclerosing cholangitis plus fibrosis was one of the outliers, as is post-liver transplants. We have to analyze and dive deeper. Maybe we find some parameters that were not really assessed correctly, and that can always be. And here's just another category. You see it worked from almost all patients, with the exception of one in which the value was slightly off. So, any study, any analysis has limitations, of which the most obvious one, pathology, is only semi-standardized. No matter what you do, you're dealing with humans that have a certain way of doing things. And if that changes, and based on the time during the day, there will be some sort of differences, and that is very, very di difficult to objectivize and to ensure there is no variation on the reference, the gold standard side. And also we can't exclude a learning curve when it comes to tissue sampling, our own analysis. You might argue that's a good thing because we have become better, but that's exactly the problem. Maybe the last measurements were a bit more accurate than the first measurements on ultrasound, so here we can't exclude 100% that will be always the same at the beginning and end of the trial. But here is some strength, which I think is good. It's a relatively large number of patients for which we have timely and spatially synchronized sampling. And we had a wide range of indications. We did not exclude autoimmune hepatitis or anything else, which is good for a learning algorithm to see if we have universal applicability of our results. Now, in summary, liver fat quantification will become an important thing in the future, beyond the liver itself, beyond chronic liver disease. It goes into the domain of cancer treatment, and there will be a lot of work to be done on stratification and therapy monitoring in light of the coming um, drugs that are coming out and need to be tested for its effectiveness. Both ultrasound and CT correlate well with each other, and I would argue at the moment really accurately predict the risk of the patient when it comes to fatty liver disease. Interesting enough, dual energy CT performs slightly better than normalized local variants on ultrasound, but both are very, very close. So I'm, it would be tough to argue against either of those techniques. And certainly texture analysis on CT really changed the game. It drastically improved the fatty liver analysis on CT because it got rid of the confounding factors of fibrosis. And I would like to leave the last comment for you to think about maybe until the next year when we maybe discuss the topic again and see that is CT is better than ultrasound, better than MRI. Thank you so much.